Hi, everyone. I'm Lourdes Terecha. I'm really excited to be here at Pepper to talk about some of the work that we've been doing, particularly one piece of work that the working group that we had at Tripped um, with Nishant and, and um, about 20 other cross-functional uh, privacy folks, not just from legal and engineering, but also founders and startup operators who are building in this space, um, created or worked on, drafted and published last year to help define this space. Um, I do want to take the time to acknowledge that uh, beyond Pepper and privacy tech, uh, the topic of discussion, I, I want to take the time to acknowledge what happened today, which is the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. And um, I know that it's been rough for many of us, and I've seen folks in the chat um, expressing their sentiments. And so I, I hear you, and this is not the end. We will all fight and respond. It doesn't mean that we will just take this. There, there, will, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, but having said that, thank you for listening to us. And I'm excited to be here to present about some of the work that we're doing defining this space, this emerging privacy tech industry to help fuel this space and to make it more actionable and talk about how privacy engineers can help do that in their work capacities, personal capacities, in their capacities as buyers, as, as maybe perhaps angel investors or board advisors, as some of you that I know are, are, are already doing. And so with that, um, Nishant, I'd love to turn it to you for your own personal intro. Thank you, Lourdes. My name is Nishant Bajaria. I'm the Director of Privacy Engineering at Uber. I've had similar roles before, as, as was mentioned before, at Netflix and Nike and Google. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so grateful to be on the panel with Lourdes, simply because there was a need for a conversation that includes people who actually action, orchestrate, and lead privacy in the background. And some of us have risen through the ranks over the last decade as privacy and security went from being esoteric nice to haves to being something that is critical for a company in terms of building trust into the platform. Uh, my approach to privacy engineering tends to be focused on how do we A, automate it, B, scale it, and C, make it available to all customers in a way that is intuitive, not just for external customers, but internal engineering customers as well. Because at the end of the day, unless you think about privacy as a product and a feature and a capability that benefits customers, it's going to be a rough go to make it work at companies, organizations, or governments alike. So whether it's the larger existential challenges of the day or whether it's something about monetization, privacy is a critical part of the conversation. So I'm super happy that Lourdes has led this initiative. I'm happy to be a part of it, happy to be with you today. And I couldn't agree more, Nishant. Thank you for helping us fuel this space. Um, I think there's this big gap of trying to bridge the bridge the silos and, and break down the silos and bridge the gaps between um, privacy engineers like you, uh, privacy lawyers that you work with, privacy founders, most of whom aren't actually from the privacy domain, and the investors writing checks to build tools um, today. And so I think it might be helpful to give maybe spend just maybe like three minutes setting up what the heck we're talking about. So the rise of privacy tech or trope, as we like to say, is an initiative to kind of bridge those gaps I was talking about earlier. And one of the first things that we did was to define the space in a white paper that we published last year. And I'm happy to put a link in the Slack shortly later to do that. And we did this for several reasons. We talked to cross-functional buyers, pri developers, privacy engineers, GRC people, and obviously lawyers, DPOs, about, about the confusion that they're getting from the market, right? Like there's so much noise in the emerging privacy tech market and people were just talking past each other. So there were a lot of things that we wanted to cover in this white paper and, um, you know, thanks to the expertise of folks like Nishant Bajaria, who talked about more some of the more technical privacy pain points, we were able to come up with something that was um, foundational, but also actionable. And we'll cover some of those um, later. So Trope is a privacy tech industry hub. So if you're, you know, if you want to be an angel investor, if you want to be a founder, if you want, if you're a buyer, or if you just want to build privacy tech tools, um, this is our way of bringing together cross-functional folks to fuel uh, the industry. And that's the white, um, white paper that we published last year. We'll, we'll share more of that um, in the Slack. Um, the why, you know, why we did it, as, as I said, it was to avoid vaporware in this space and make sure this space actually succeeds right before it even takes off. Um, avoid privacy washing, avoid talking past each other. 
uh, guide privacy tech industry players and just do a lot of awareness and understanding when it comes to key engineering concepts um, and defining the stack. So one of the things that we did in the white paper was to define privacy tech, which uh, we came up with two definitions. So there are technical solutions to privacy problems. And then the second one is the emerging industry of tech companies building solutions to privacy problems. Uh, pretty standard. There's nothing mind blowing about those definitions. Uh, and then we came up with a stack that said it's not, it's, it's a living document. It's, we're actually in the process of updating it in 2022. We just had a working group meeting today to do that. But I want to share the things that we, sh that we took into account when creating the privacy tech stack. So we thought about the business model. Most of the startups that we saw are in the B2B space, so, but we also saw B2B2C and B2C. Uh, products popping up, right? Like, and it makes sense that there are consumer privacy tech products because privacy is about people after all. Other things that we took into account are the data life cycle. Um, and then with Nishant's input, we shifted it further to the left and even, and talked about the development life cycle because some of the privacy problems that we're seeing um, are actually happening even before we collect data, when we start developing products and systems and and um, other technologies. And then we start, you know, in addition to that, we, we look at the adjacent industry um, like cybersecurity, uh, data, legal tech, and so on. And so uh, this, these are just some of the headers of this stack. I'm not sure if, this, if the slides are showing that. And uh, B2B, B2B2C, B2C. Um, in the B2B side, we have the data lifecycle products and the development lifecycle products. And then in the data lifecycle products, we have tools throughout the, the data lifecycle, right? We have tools at collection, like the consent management tools. Um, we have pets uh, under use and sharing, um, and then throughout it. And then in the development lifecycle, really, are some of the more exciting startups that we're seeing that are doing work shifting privacy left. And you probably heard about some of them. Um, they're doing privacy code scanners. They're doing training. Uh, they're doing requirements for uh, privacy requirements for developers. Uh, and, and those are just some of the things. But we're actually in the process of updating this. So one of the calls to action that we have later is for those who would like to get involved in this year's working group, you know, let's chat and let's update, let help us define this space. Um, Nisha, I, I want to ask a question about the development life cycle. You were one of the first people that I uh, approached when we were starting to define the development life cycle. And if you remember um, about a year ago today, we sat down to really think through the privacy problems during the development life cycle and what products there could look like. And maybe to refresh your memory, this was like what we came up with um, right, it's not very clear, but I'm curious, like, what is, how do you feel about the, the state of privacy tech when it comes to developer tools today? Like, there's a lot of, of things to be done to update this and to also mature it. I'm curious, are there any pri promising privacy tech solutions out there? Um, what are some of your advice when it comes to the founders that are co coming to you who are building in this space? Because the right side when it comes to compliance and stuff are kind of saturated, to be honest. Um, I'm curious, like, what are some of the learnings and the, the takeaways that you're seeing just as an advisor, as a buyer, as an advisor um, of, of these tools? Advisor to these startups as a buyer, as a user. Yeah. So I'm going to hold on to something you said, Lourdes, at the very beginning of your question about how the privacy challenge and the privacy tooling begins even before the collection of the data, right? Yep. So let, let's work backwards from my expectations. If you are a founder, if you are a VC, or if you are somebody who's like putting out a product out there for monetization and growth purposes, you are looking at it through the lens of growth. You're looking at it through the lens of quick engagement, because unless you get that initial start, unless you capture the moment of truth, as they used to say back in my Netflix days, uh, you, you're pretty much dead in the water, or so you think, because that you never get a second chance to make that initial first impression, right? And at the same time, the customers are no picnic either. They want stuff to work pretty quickly. Like when I 
get done with my workday, I want to open Netflix and I'm going to start to watch something. And what do I want? I want the login to work quickly. I want my recommendations to come up quickly. And I want to make sure that something is playing in the background before I start cooking there. So everybody has optimized for speed, which means the backend infrastructure, which means the data collection mechanism, which means the APIs, which means the internal queries, they are all optimized for rapid movement. That is eventual consistency to make sure that it will all work out in the end. But initially the goal is to grow our data and grow our functionality as quickly as possible. So it is extremely important when people say shift flex from a security perspective, what they're talking about is catch threats early as they are materializing. On the privacy use case, it's shift left, left, as I like to call it. You got to go one step before security simply because security tools are built with a very binary adversarial mindset. And there is a, at least in most cases, an understanding of the kinds of threats you'll emanate. But from a privacy perspective, how many GPS points exist in your location data? How direct is the time? How recent is the data? How much different pieces, how, how many different pieces of data do we have across different databases? All of those put together with the right metadata and the right third party context creates a different re-identification risk versus having them all disconnected from each other. So I kind of feel like you need a lot of this tooling training in, in place well before data collection happens because it will guide A, what you collect, B, who can access it, C, how, does, how do you map policy across the organization to the data as it travels down the pipe, right? And the reason this is important, uh, Lourdes, is that engineers will do things that are intuitive in nature because they want to get from A to B quickly once they know what to build. And everything else that is extraneous to their thinking almost seems like it should happen automatically or somebody else should take care of it. And I know this because most engineers have been incentivized this way. You get promoted based on getting an idea from zero to one, owning a big chunk of it. And sometimes time is your enemy in that regard. So having all these checks and controls in place right across the pipeline is pretty critical before, during, and after the collection. So let me give you a specific example. When it comes to training our key stakeholders in the company, executives, or people who are busy all the time with malware and phishing, we, the way we do that is by sending people spoof emails. And sometimes, and I've done this myself, they click on it and they're told this was a phishing simulation, right? We do that randomly to create conversation, to create, you know, bring people's attention to the fact that this risk exists. Now that's for human beings. Privacy harms often happen not because human beings typically behave badly, although that is true in some cases, but in a lot of cases, there's a service I wrote that you repurposed with data that somebody else collected. It's the combination, I keep saying over and over again, it's the combination of circumstances that grows privacy risk. So rather than having random checks, you want these checks scattered all over the infrastructure, all over the data lifecycle to increase A, the risk of catching these issues before they happen, B, to create training opportunities, and C, to identify a pattern of exactly the kind of data, the kind of teams, the kind of usages that create this risk and then repurposing the infrastructure. So essentially you are building artificial intelligence to understand what the privacy risk is and using that to build privacy tech across the pipeline. I know that's kind of a long answer, but you have to think about this pretty early in the process. And I especially aim this at founders because you have it far easier than the Googles and the Facebooks and the matters of the world because they have years and years of habits, tech debt built up. You have a chance to do this right because you don't have that kind of debt. Well, guess what else you don't have? You don't have that kind of cash and the talent they have at, at their disposal. So doing this right is not just the right thing to do. The future you will thank the present you if you do it right from the very beginning right now. That's, I mean, all great points. And this is exactly why we want people like you and we approach uh, people like you as who are domain experts, but also buyers and users of these tools to get involved and get that feedback back to the founders, right? Like those are very helpful um, insights to give them. And I want to quote one of the one of the first CPOs in the world, actually, who, who isn't a lawyer. Uh, they're uh, one of the technical CPOs, the first technical CPOs. And one of the comments that they made in a meeting that we had earlier this week was, you know, stop building us tools that you think we need. Like actually listen to us and and build us like what we need, like instead of selling us things that you think we need. So there, there is that, I want to highlight what you just said, because it's very important feedback that I think many of the builders in the emerging privacy tech space need to hear. And so with that in mind, you've, you've given me the perfect opportunity to, to transition to the meat of the discussion to make this actionable for the Pepper community, which is like, why do you think, Nishant, as a privacy engineer, why do you think it's important for other privacy engineers to get involved in this emerging space, in this nascent space? Like, what has it, what, what, what has it been like for you? Like, what's the benefit um, for you to get involved this early on? 
So two benefits, and they both apply not just to the companies and the customers and the compliance end of the conversation, but the engineers themselves as well. And I think it's important for any appeal you make vis-a-vis -vis privacy to work at a very cerebral level, not just at the ethical level, because too many privacy professionals, attorneys, engineers, compliance experts make the mistake of treating privacy like a personal cause. And, the, and good for you if you have that level of moral principle. I genuinely support that. But the problem is the board of directors and the C-suite has to make decisions based on financial risk. So it's extremely important to frame the benefits of privacy in financial business efficiency terms. Otherwise, you are going nowhere. You will write the most beautiful memos. You will come up with the most beautiful slides, but that's all that will remain, memos and slides. So I would say there are two benefits. The first is engineers, like at least when I, was, when I wrote code back in the day and I just do on weekends, they hate uncertainty. What I mean is they hate the idea of, of building something and not knowing if that will ship because at the last moment is the dreaded PIA, privacy impact assessment process, or the DPIA that will identify a risk, at which point you have two options sometimes nuke the project or delay it indefinitely and lose out on promotions, market engagement, what have you, or go to market with the risk. Nobody wants to be making that call. So the one key tactical benefit is that you avoid that dreaded conversation and building privacy engineering into the process. Getting involved in shaping privacy tech means that you are creating a more predictable, dependable, marketable cadence for the release of your products. So at the end of the day, I don't care whether you're a privacy engineer or a security engineer or just a regular engineer, full stack back and front end your job, your efficiency will be judged based on how much you grow the company, how much you reduce the risk. Like you have to map things to benefit to the company, benefit to the customer. So that's why it's extremely important for privacy engineers to get involved in privacy tech because there's a lot of tooling, but there's a lot of disconnected conversations about what tooling will make what benefit. The second thing is a lot of privacy tech has other uses as well. So I often talk about how I was, and I cut my teeth for all intents and purposes at night at Netflix. I did privacy engineering before Netflix, and I have done it since, but some of the most seminal lessons in this domain I learned during my Netflix days from Neil Hunt, who was Netflix's iconic, legendary chief product officer. He's kind enough to write the foreword for my book. I have to plug it at least once, Data Privacy or Handbook for Engineers. The publisher gets mad if I don't mention it. So the key benefit, and I think you should listen to this carefully, engineers on the phone, is that we are at an important moment in the tech industry, in the American economy, as a society, where we have built attorneys and engineers that are very, very depth focused. They understand their domain, they understand their CICD pipeline, they understand their personalized uh, cadence very, very well. And what that means is they can ship their products out almost on, on, on autopilot. Like there is no surprise left to have for them. The problem is all the threats we encounter from privacy are contextual. They are combination threats. What that means is what you do today, what I did yesterday and what somebody else does the day after, creates a unique dynamic of privacy risk. And so when you start building tooling in privacy tech, you start understanding things that are not just depth focused, but breadth focused as well. And when you come to the table with that level of expertise, you find out that you can now talk intelligently about privacy with engineers across the company, with experts in machine learning, with people on the platform data side, with people on the uh, marketing personalization side, people on the growth side, attorneys, board members. I'm not sure how many engineers out there can have such a huge impact. And this will help you build better tooling at your company. This will help you market yourself and your cause better. And this will help uplift your career in ways that you haven't even imagined. If you are a great Haskell engineer, well, there are other people who write Haskell. You might not be the best engineer, but if you can be somebody who can speak to so many audiences, your ability to levitate across the company and try different kinds of jobs beyond privacy goes up significantly. Your ability to work on platform misinformation, public safety, fairness, bias increases as well. Because all of these skills, all of these challenges require something critical. They require cross-platform experience, the ability to talk to different stakeholders. So if your goal is to become an architect, a CTO, a CISO, or a chief privacy officer, chief trust safety officer, if you want those kinds of roles and fundamentally differentiate yourself from others and then differentiate your products as a company from the products made by other companies, privacy engineering is a great skill set to have. So it's about making not just yourself and your own career, but your products and your company further differentiated. It's a bit like, when you come out as a privacy engineer with experience in privacy tech, you are selling a car with seat belts and airbags versus somebody else down the street who might be selling a car without those features. They have the first, to, first mover advantage, but at some point, your overall product quality from a safety and trust perspective will win the day because frankly, the markets will expect more. Today, nobody in their right mind would buy a car without those safety features, right? There will come a time soon where the combination of regulation, the combination of public sentiment and media scrutiny 
will make privacy just as indispensable and you will be ready to cash in on that moment. So it's again, not just the right thing to do from an altruistic you know, human rights perspective, it's also good, sound, smart business. I love how you've made the case for this um, as a value space one and not a compliance one, but base one, because I, I mean, the, that argument rarely resonates with folks who aren't legal policy folks. So the case for privacy and privacy tech as product excellence is something that I, I think um, resonates better, especially when I talk to developers and more technical teams. And I love how, uh, I particularly love the point about um, career development and professional development in general, because I mean, who doesn't want to succeed in their careers, right? So beyond doing the right thing, beyond compliance, there are clear values um, and, and, and benefits to getting involved in this space. Um, let's speak to- One more argument, sorry. Sure. You made me I think the other argument, the word compliance often gets my antenna going up simply because compliance scares me a little bit in the sense where it creates the impression that all we are doing is checking the box. And my former Uber colleague, yeah. Melanie Ensign, who is doing amazing work these days. Uh, as an I was just on the phone like 30 minutes ago with her. I love her. Anything she says, I, I think people should listen to. Like she could read the script of The Simpsons and I will listen to it carefully. Uh, the compliance <laughs> often evokes a check the box mentality where people think that's what you're doing. And eventually that's what you end up doing because the compliance has been reduced to that. But the real problem with compliance in my a compliance only mindset is that compliance keeps changing. Like we've gone as privacy professionals to engineers and told them, drop everything, do this because GDPR. Then we said, drop everything, do this because CCPA. Then drop everything because CPRA. It almost feels like we have been crying wolf a little too often. So make a compliance based argument, but make that your second argument. If that's your first yeah. argument, some people will tune out because they think that you are raising hell all over again, just like you raised hell last day, last week, and you will raise hell again next week. And people will tune you out. I've talked to many, many engineers in the Valley, and that is where some of the fatigue comes in, where you have an external brand perception that does not improve, even as the company makes significant investments in compliance, and engineers get bored and tired and they leave, and the board of director wonders, directors wonders why the company's reputation doesn't, doesn't improve. So you almost end up in a situation where companies don't pay a price for this commercially, but they still don't quite meet the public trust mark. So the compliance argument is important, but in my opinion, make it your second argument, not your first one. Absolutely. And there are two things that are that is wrong with making it your first argument. First, it's a stick, not a carrot, right? And the second part is that despite the developments in global data protection laws, you know, compliance and laws in general will always still lag behind tech. Let's just face it. Like, despite the pace of data protection laws are getting passed all over the world, it's still not as fast when it comes to technological developments. And so we really, you know, like it's a good second argument as you were saying, um, but I'm I'm right there with you in terms of making it uh, a backup argument, especially when, when you're talking to non-technical folks. I do wanna make this even more actionable. Like how, what's your advice to other privacy engineers? How can they get involved in this space? And they can do it in different capacities, right? Like in my head, they can do it as buyers and users of privacy tech. They can do it if they can, if they have the, the capacity as angel investors, as board advisors, as domain experts who want to share their insights and research and um, the innovations that, that they're doing themselves in, internally. But I'm curious, like, what are some of the easy ways that they can do this? Let's I think start, let's start with, um, maybe let's start as domain experts because everyone here are privacy domain experts. They're privacy engineers. So let's let's maybe start with that. Yeah, so I would basically, I mean, the slides you've built pretty much uh, spell it out, but let me just say this way. There is a lot of appetite for doing privacy, right? And I think historically we've had a challenge on the privacy and to an extent the security side less on the security than the privacy side that we've dismissed privacy as primarily a legal construct, which is only attorneys can take care of it, right? Guess what? I work with a lot of privacy attorneys and they genuinely want engineering help. Like they want to decide, do I buy tool X that is a platform solution or do I buy tool Y that is more of a CMS checklist type solution? And you guys probably guess which tools I'm talking about, but I'm not going to mention proper nouns here because we are, we're all friends, the small community here. Yes. So how do you build the right solution? So essentially, explaining how privacy tooling works behind the scenes. What lessons did you learn? And that's part of the reason I wrote the book, Lotus. The book is full of not just how to do things right, how I've fixed some of these problems, but I've been maybe to a fault, reasonably candid about my own mistakes. 
things that I did that seemed like a good idea back then that didn't work. So essentially, maybe de um, anonymizing your experiences, coming up with uh, amalgamations or anonymized examples would be helpful to say, here's tooling that works and here's tooling that doesn't work. Coming just as engineers, like if you YouTube, if you go to YouTube and say Facebook product management interviews, you'll find tons of videos where people talk about how Facebook does product interviews, right? And those are amazingly well shot videos where people simulate it for you. You can do the same thing from a privacy perspective as well. So become a part of that conversation, create a movement, come up with ideas based on your past. It's almost like you can either do things the way somebody else does things, or you can have them do things your way or come up with a hybrid approach. So the more conversation we have on this topic based on people that have done this before, the better. That's number one. And also, yep. secondly, uh, explain to, you know, open source your code. If you build out these solutions, uh, especially in the book and in the certification that is coming up on this topic, I've come up with a lot of actual examples on here's how you build it. Here's how you measure success. Here's how you come up with the right metrics. Here's how you shape the message. So come up with those and train people. And honestly, you don't have to be a privacy engineer to do it. You can be somebody who helped with privacy engineering in your company because in a lot of small companies, the security engineer, the privacy engineer, and the IT engineer is one and the same engineer. So explain how you do things in different scenarios. So in my mind, a privacy engineer who did this at Google versus somebody who did this at Pinterest versus somebody who did this at the federated source, source company that owns Macy's, they all have equal value because we are talking about different business models here. And the cumulative nature of this work can be very, very instructive. But the third thing you can do that is my personal favorite is to ensure that the people on the legal policy government relations side understand the choices that are made here. They understand the implications. So it's almost like if I could shape the world and my hope is we can still shape it, I'm confident we can, is that in a room where a conversation like this happens, it's critical that the privacy attorneys, the policy folks and the engineers talk together. Like I was on a forum hosted by the Atlantic magazine a couple of months ago, hosted by Ron Brownstein. And it had a lot of policy folks. You had people, all the big names in Washington, DC, some of them were on the call and I was the only engineer. And I gently made fun of them saying that any privacy law that you pass right now should be renamed the Nishan Job Security Act because the conversation is so high level and so ambiguous that any law that emerges from this conversation will be by its very definition so ambiguous and so unactionable that people like me will have jobs forever. So when I argue for more collaboration between privacy engineers and the policy shops, I'm arguing against economic self-interest because that conversation will create clearer laws, more measurable outcomes, and a better way to judge customer benefits. And they will put me out of business because frankly, my biggest role right now is to make sure that the business arm, the legal arm on the one side, and the engineering arm on the other side actually talk to each other because they are part of the same body. So I feel like privacy domain experts can use their bio, use their work, and use their background to shape the conversation and the actual quality of the work. And also, if you do that, you are encouraging other companies to build better tooling, which if enough companies start doing things the same correct way, that will in the, eventually shape the building of privacy regulations as well. Because we've made this mistake of thinking that we have to build privacy in response to regulation. Why not build privacy tooling and shape the regulation as well? The traffic should go both ways. The idea that engineers should be order takers from the policy folks is frankly an antediluvian concept that needs to be thrown out the window because we've done that for the last four or five years. And where are we at right now where we have tons of awareness, tons of detail, a lot of experts, but frankly, I don't think the customer out there genuinely believes that big tech has gotten privacy right. And I think that's what we need to fix. Absolutely. I mean, so I, I heard so many um, great nuggets there. Weigh in, you know, use your domain expertise, especially because it's technical expertise that is sorely needed, um, not just in the policy side, but the founders, the builders, the startups are building in this space. Most of the, I've probably talked to more than 200 privacy tech founders. I was surprised to find out that, uh, you know, less than 10% of them have privacy domain expertise. So they, they sorely need uh, people like you, Nishan, and the privacy engineers here at Pepper to get involved and share your experience, you know, become advisors, um, help build privacy tech solutions, join them, um, better articulate the technical privacy problems that you're seeing in your careers, uh, and then be very frank about what's promising and what's not effective in, in terms of the products that you're seeing out there, because the worst thing that we could do is just like keep talking about, about some of these startups that are emerging and say, oh, you know, like great marketing. But when you look under the hood, there's not much there. Uh, and that's something that keeps coming up in conversations behind closed doors is, you know, are these actually, are these tools actually solving problems? And I feel like we, we could avoid that scenario, that problem, if we 
we bring in domain expertise, especially from privacy engineers like you, Nishant. Um, yeah, provide feedback. I'm curious, like you've done more than that though, beyond your domain expertise, beyond your uh, you know, your status as a bio user, you've actually also gone beyond and started advising these startups and started angel investing in some of them. Um, what are some advice that you might have? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if this resonates with this audience, but to those who are in that position who might want to venture further and, and do more, not just as buyers and users or as domain experts, may, they may want to do more to really fuel this emerging industry. What are some advice that you have uh, based on your own practice? As in, I'm, I'm happy to share some of mine too as an angel investor and board advisor for some of these privacy tech startups. Totally. So the reason that Lourdes, I started advising these startups is not necessarily because I had a lot of time on my hands or that I had friends to after. Uh, there's, often, there's often been the situation where I'm literally on the buyer's side, like I need a solution and I'm listening to the, the person building the tool. And what often happens is that the product is worse than the pitch, but in this specific case, the pitch is worse than the product. Like if you set up an hour on my time, my first question is why do you set up an hour with me? 30 minutes is fine. Nothing useful happens in a meeting past the 31st minute anyways. So that was a little Friday afternoon snark, hopefully. Uh, but what often happens is people set up times to talk to me, to pitch me a product or get me advice. And until minute 20, they go on about GDPR and CCP and customer trust. And I have to tell them that in this age of attention deficit disorder, and I actually have ADD myself, you want to get me to the value proposition as quickly as possible. So we have the situation where a lot of people are building amazing privacy tools. And that's the tragedy, Lourdes, is that these people have amazing ideas. In a lot of cases, the tools are awesome but they have no idea how to sell it. And they often make me a pitch that is very, very legal specific that it belongs to the privacy attorney. Like I am deeply familiar with GDPR and CCP and ISO 27701, but I'm not an attorney and there is just no way I can make a legal argument. And I tell my team of engineers very carefully, expand your horizon, make a bigger impact, shape the conversation, but do not, do not, do not offer legal advice. So my first, the first mistake a lot of these founders are making on the privacy tech space is that they don't quite know how to sell their product. Yep. That, that in turn makes it very hard for me to convince my internal stakeholders, especially on the finance and legal side, that this works well because I just don't have enough context. So my first goal in advising these startups is to make sure that the pitch and the product don't pass each other by too big a margin. There's always a case where the pitch has to catch up. In some cases, the sales folks get overexcited and the product has to catch up. But if the gap between the pitch and the product gets too wide, that's a problem because either you'll end up selling stuff and not delivering it or you will fail to deliver stuff that is worth delivering because you don't know how to sell it, right? So my first goal was to make sure that the engineers who are selling this stuff get better. And my goal is to create more competition because frankly, as a buyer, I want product A, product B, and C to compete for my attention. And competition is always wonderful. I'm a Milton Friedman free market kind of guy. So I, I want more competition in the market. So I want good, hardworking engineers to succeed and actually make good money and solve the problem that we all care about. But I also want to make sure that there are more options across the board, right? That's number two. The third reason I do it is because it will force a better conversation. A lot of these companies on the buyer side need better privacy tooling, but they don't know how to start because all of them have different contexts, right? Mm -hmm. So advising these privacy tech products mean, companies means that I can now give them a position of power and confidence so that they can advise their future buyers. And when you have a relationship coming in as equals, just because you are selling me something doesn't mean I should have all the power you should be able to bring something to the table, challenge me and force me to think twice. And I'm like, oh, this person knows something I didn't. Let's do a proof of concept. Then I can bring engineering to the table and they see the tool working. They see relationships forming across the board. And then at that point, it feels like a bottom-up conversation where the engineers who are two, three, four, five levels below me can make the argument for me. Then it's not just me going to the board of directors and making the case to buy the tool. It's the engineers who are both the source of growth and engagement on the one side, and frankly, the source of privacy harm on the other side. I need those engineers from the bottom up to make the case. So I do it not just because I'm a nice guy, although I feel we should hold on to that thought for a second. It's because I want better tools and I want these engineers to succeed. And frankly, I want me to have more choices when I'm spending money, my shareholders' money to buy privacy solutions. Thank you for sharing that. And that's, you know, that's certainly a very good point to make, especially because we've been dealing with privacy technical debt for decades, right? Like we've been building technologies with, without much regard for privacy and to be able to be in a position where you could impact the way new builders are building their technologies and, and, and get some of the problems that you have, your technical privacy problems solved by them 
um, by advising them or investing in them or just giving them feedback as a buyer um, is a complete 180 uh, compared to where we've been for decades. So it's, it's a good time um, for us in general. And one of my goals is to make sure that we set up this industry for success uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, going with tools that may not be uh, able to deliver when it comes to their promise of, of privacy solutions. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I, I, I bet folks have questions. So uh, just to summarize, there are a lot of opportunities out there. There are advisory roles at privacy tech startups, our consulting roles, our in-house privacy roles. We know some CPOs and privacy engineers that are now working for privacy tech startups, not just tech, big tech companies in general. Um, and so, you know, we, you could demo these ones. And I, I know Nishant, we've, you've POC'd some of these startups through Troth and been paid as a buyer to review some of these startups. So if folks there here are interested, let us know. And then obviously we also have, um, angel investing opportunities in some of these emerging privacy tech startups. And, and I also know some engineers and privacy domain experts uh, who are now co-founding their own privacy tech startups. So we, we'd love to, we love to see that absolutely because we want domain experts to help solve these problems in an informed way. Um, with that in mind, I do, we have about like five minutes. So I wanna give it back to the moderator in case there are questions. <laughs> yeah, there've been a lot of questions and discussion on Slack. It really the biggest theme is really around arguments and morals and values arguments for privacy. Of As okay. people in this room that care about privacy, there's sort of a lot of ways and strategies that people use to advocate. And a lot of people I think from discussion really see a lot of value in, in the morals and values-based arguments for privacy. And also are interested in hearing about some of the strategies to make financial type value arguments and how do you both navigate that space of the moral and financial trade-offs and sort of bringing the right arguments to to advocate for adoption of privacy technologies i'm not going to speak for nishan but for me the moral arguments are paramount and very important that's the reason why i work in privacy but i also recognize that they don't resonate with everyone especially when you're you know, when you're in tech, right? Like, so the way I look at it, I make different arguments based on my audience. So if I'm talking to engineers, I'm gonna make the business case for privacy from a product excellence standpoint. If I'm talking to finance and business people and VCs, I'm gonna make the case for privacy from a value ROI financial standpoint. If, I, if I'm talking to regulators, then we'll talk compliance and societal good, uh, benefits and so on. And so I don't think it's an either, either or thing. I think it's a good idea to diversify your toolbox and have a bunch of privacy quote unquote carrots when you're you know, so you can pull one out and, and, and just really get to know who your audience is. Um, but I'm, I'm with everyone. I, I, I'm, I'm in privacy because I care. I mean, it's, it's what keeps me up, um, you know, in the morning and, and, and to keep doing this type of work. But the, you have to be practical and realize that not everyone feels the same way. Not everyone in tech or in the world cares about privacy from a moral <laughs> standpoint. And so you kind of have to meet them where they are. So I began this call by saying that make the compliance argument second. And when I usually do my presentation, now I used to be just full disclosure before, I used to be a debater in college. I love sort of saving the narrative, the moral narrative at the end to make sure people remember. Because my belief is people listen to you because of data, people follow you because of values. So I start with the data, but then I give people a specific example. So I live in Mountain View, California, and I often go to Stanford to get my eyes checked once every three months or once every six months at the latest. Because as a teenager, 20 years, some years ago, I had narrow angle glaucoma. This is typically a disease that hits people when they are 60 plus. I'm one of the lucky ones. I got it when I was in my teens. So if you were to map, if I were to say, take a walk from my house, go on a bike from my house to Stanford. And if you were to track my movements, right? And if you were to get GPS coordinates with like, or rather lat long coordinates with like five decimal points, you would know exactly where I went to Stanford. And because the buildings are so huge, the facilities are so huge, depending upon where I park my bike, you could identify that I went to see the eye doctor or I went to see the neuro neurology doctor or I went to see some other doctor. Bottom line is, if you track the fact that I go there once every X months, then without following me once I this month get off the bike, you could know that I have one of three diseases, right? That's not a good idea. I don't want you to know that. Of course, I've talked about this publicly before. 
as part of research into, into my, my eye condition, you know it, but you don't get to know it just by tracking me without my permission. So there is a human connection. But fine, if you find out that I have an eye, eye condition 20 years ago, no biggie. But let's assume I'm a dissident in a country that has a specious human rights record. You tracking me, having that location live in your database someplace that then gets breached because you weren't careful enough to encrypt it or manage access control. Now the government that I'm fighting against knows exactly where I live or they know exactly where I'm going to be next Friday morning at nine o'clock. Your sloppiness with privacy co could cost me my life. What kind of growth is worth it if it comes at the expense of my life? How is that going to look in the New York Times? How would that, how would that make you feel if, if a friend of yours or a family, a friend, family members of yours were affected that way? So my general approach is to not do it too often because it often feels like sermonizing. And if you do it over and over again, people lose the punch of it. But it's extremely important to remember that when it comes to privacy, your platform, your strategy is only as strong as your weakest link. And it's important to remember that the person who doesn't have the time to read the privacy policy or the person that doesn't have all the money to sue you in court often stands to lose the most. As a society, we often, we rarely lose the chance to punish people because they're poor and powerless, right? That's who always suffers when people make bad decisions, whether it's COVID lockdowns, whether it's recessions, the people who suffer the most are the weakest and the poorest. And if we as an industry give up on protecting them, what kind of a world are we creating? Would this, want to, would this be a world that we want to raise our kids in? So it's important to remember that behind all the Tableau dashboards, behind all the alerts, behind all the personalization tools, behind all the ML models is a human being and their data. And that human being doesn't know that you exist. So remember that human being when you build these tools and bring that sensibility with you when you showcase these tools to the engineers that in your company might be a bit skeptical. So it's helpful to not essentially lead with that argument, but not leave home without making that argument. So. Yeah, thank you. And we don't have any more time for questions, but this triggered a lot of really interesting discussion on Slack about values and reasons to adopt privacy and advocate for privacy. So would recommend continuing discussion on Slack and looking there for more information.